March 1st, 1932, Charles Augustus Lindbergh Jr., the 20-month-old son of Charles Lindbergh and Anne Moreau Lindbergh, was abducted from his crib. His room was on an upper floor in the home in East Amwelt, New Jersey. Sadly, the child was found deceased on May 12, 1932, by a truck driver who had stopped to use the restroom. No evidence showed that the kidnappers planned to return the boy upon payment as stated in the ransom note. There was no law to protect those victims stolen from their life by the federal law enforcement. Congress saw a need. The Federal Kidnapping Act of 1932 was introduced and passed into law following this national tragedy. If a man like Lindbergh could have his child stolen, then how could those without money keep their children safe? The Federal Kidnapping Act of 1932 allows federal authorities to step in and pursue kidnappers once they've crossed state lines with their victims. Following the passing of this law, several states followed suit passing what is known as Little Lindbergh Laws covering kidnappings that did not cross state lines. Some of those states put up some of the toughest sentences for breaking the law. If the victim is harmed in any way, it qualifies the kidnappers for capital punishment. As of date, we only have three convictions under this law. Lewis Jones Jr. kidnapped Tracy McBride, which resulted in her death. He was sentenced to and put to death. Arthur Gooch kidnapped two Texas officers, released them unharmed in Oklahoma. He was sentenced to death. He was the only one punished under this law in which the victim did not die. Finally, Lisa Marie Montgomery kidnapped Bobby Joe Stennett's unborn baby, drove across state lines, and trying to pass the premature infant as her own. Bobby Joe was left to die from her wounds. This was when the first Amber Alert was issued in which the child could not be identified and neither could the perpetrator nor the vehicle he or she drove. One thing is for sure, no one expected to find Lisa Marie as the one capable of such a heinous crime. Back in Skidmore, a mother was lost without her only daughter, and a husband and father lost his wife and possibly his only daughter just before they could get their lives started. Receiving a federal death sentence is reserved for those who commit federal capital offenses, treason, murder, robbery, piracy, mutiny, hostility against the U.S., counterfeiting, and aiding the escape of a capital prisoner. The Federal Correction Complex, Terre Haute, became the only federal prison in America to execute federal death row inmates. Seven hours away from Melbourne, Kansas, where Lisa Marie Montgomery sat with a newborn baby that she had given birth to. Well, as far as her husband and children knew. Welcome to the True Crime Librarian. I'm your librarian and host, Ashley. Tonight we take a look at a case that made national news for an Amber Alert being issued for an unborn child. Then it was neatly tucked away once the child was found just two and a half hours away in Melbourne, Kansas. The woman was Lisa Marie Montgomery. She sat on a couch in her living room with a newborn baby between her and her husband. Back in Skidmore, the town was buzzing for the second time in this tiny community. First, due to Ken McElroy, 23 years prior, now because one of their own had been taken from this world in such a vicious way and stolen was a child, many were eager to meet in one short month. Warning, this episode contains graphic detail of mental, physical abuse, child sexual assault, murder, and adult language. Listener's discretion is advised. If you feel any of this may be too much for you, please skip this episode or have someone listen with you or for you.
Good evening, my true crime nerds. I am so glad to finally be back after our little break that turned from one week to two. Thank you to all those who reached out and wished me a happy birthday. I truly appreciate it. And thank you for all of you who sent prayers and thoughts my way last week after my town went through a little bit of a tough storm. One minute it was fine. The next it wasn't. So thank you all. We finally have got to a point where I think I have some pretty stable internet. So we are recording. This will, you know, obviously air tomorrow morning or tomorrow evening. So thank you for all your patience with me in trying to get everything back on track. We are, I know I said something about maybe dropping two episodes on you, but I don't think that I'm going to do that. I think we're just going to take last week for what it was and it was a time off and we're just going to keep moving forward from here. I have a little bit of housekeeping before we get started tonight. First, many of you may notice ads popping up in the show, but don't worry, they will be short. Second, we are currently constructing the show's Patreon and ad-free listening will pop back up with its launch. The show is growing and you nerds have been welcoming to all the new listeners Not to mention, many of you have been recommending the show, and for that, you all know how thankful I am. Please continue to tell others about the show, and we'll keep growing, bringing you more ways to enjoy it all together. Don't forget to subscribe on the platform that you're currently listening on. If you're on YouTube, hit that notification button after subscribing so you never miss an upload. I don't have any true crime nerd love for you tonight. Instead, I'm just going to extend it all to everybody who is currently hearing this. Thank you all for your support and your patience. Now to what you all came here for, the true crime. So the last time we closed up on the case of John the Battaglia. Many had choice words to say about him, and believe me, I'm right there with you. This is one of the first cases I began digging into as a teenager. Even years later, I find it hard that a man was capable of doing probably one of the worst crimes I've ever heard. Tonight, we're going to start to dive into another capital punishment case, one that's on a federal level, one that is another hard to believe that someone could be capable of doing this kind of case and it's definitely going to bring into question where you stand in the great debate there let let me just go ahead and put this out there i'm not excusing i'm not siding i'm not anything i'm offering you the the view from both sides i always do never never going to stop doing it that way How you come to the end and what your decision is, is based off of you, your morality, and the way you were raised. A lot of people believe that this one should have been communicated to life. A lot of people believe she got exactly what she deserves. And a lot of people, they stay in the middle and they don't side either way because how do you make that decision in this kind of case? So... Keep that in mind. I'm not siding. I'm giving you all the facts. It's going to sound like I'm siding in this episode, and it's going to sound like I'm siding in the other way next episode. I'm not. Um, I'm from Texas. I believe in the death penalty. Um, I'm not going to change my mind on that, but I am going to tell you there's no black and white. There's gray. There's a lot of gray, and most people are just colorblind to it all. Many of us watched as the federal government put in a temporary express lane at the beginning of 2021. The big issue is we put to death Lisa Marie Montgomery. She's the first woman to die at the federal level in 67 years. She was also the first to die of three in January on the federal level in 2021. Now, Lisa's legal team, they fought to have her sentence overturned to life due to her mental handicap. There are imaging that shows that Lisa had functional abnormalities due to her premature birth caused by her mother's addiction to alcohol, physical abuse she endured as a child, 
Dr. Gurr would stand up and testify in her favor in the trial saying, quote, the brain she has may explain at least part of what happened, end quote. The Eighth Amendment bans cruel and unusual punishment, and this would define Atkins versus Virginia, ruling that the states that a person who lacks the intellectual capacity to understand how the sentence fits the crime. So if you can't make that connection, we've got a problem. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled later in Hall versus Florida, narrowing down the discretion of who would fit that criteria in the states that have capital punishment. Well, when you leave something undefined, especially in cases like Lisa Marie's, it makes it harder to feel that line and, and decide, do we execute or do we stay? Tonight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce you to Lisa Marie Montgomery. Many see her as the, the face of fetal abduction. I mean, you don't hear about fetal abduction without automatically seeing this woman's face. And whether you recognize her name or not, when her face is attached to it, you know who she is. When I first heard about this case, I'm a, I sided. I put her to death. It's exactly what she deserved. When I had started digging into this, I think there's a little bit more to it all. Do I think that she got what she deserved in the end? Yes and no. And that's my opinion. And that's as far as I'm going to go into it. Because a lot of you are going to argue with me back. And it's fine. I love that you form your opinion. I love that you stand your ground and, and you fight for your morals. And I, that's great. I don't have to explain mine. So is there something lacking in the justice system when it comes to the Eighth Amendment? I think there is. I think that we need to have a better definition as to what qualifies a person to have that lack of intellectual capacity to understand their sentence. Does that make sense? I don't think, I, if you leave it up to interpretation, there's one meaning, but a million interpretations. It, it's just, that's just the way it goes. There's a lot of things in life that people interpret and, you know, Sometimes I don't always agree with it. Sometimes I do. Many fetal abduction happens more times than one would like to think that it does or is willing to admit. But is it possible for one to see where the urge to commit one of the most despicable acts begins? Is it possible to side with the defense team who fought until the last minutes to help a murderer beat the needle? Is it possible that the justice system, the president of the United States, and all of those who harbored the authority to provide more time made a mistake in the early morning hours of January 13th, 2021? Like I said, standing with capital punishment or against it is one of the greatest debates in true crime history. We watched some big name hitters in the crime world leave this world under the power of an executioner. Florida took Bundy and Warnos. Illinois took Gacy. Other states chose to sit back and watch as time takes away the life of other big names. Kansas has Dennis Rader housed in a maximum security. Washington State has Gary Ridgway under lock and key. And Wisconsin had every intention of doing the same with Jeffrey Dahmer until he was brutally beaten to death. Most believe that it's a simple black and white debate until you find a case like this one and suddenly the gray is revealed. Like I said, let me introduce you to Lisa Marie Patterson Montgomery. She was born February 27th, 1968 to Judy Patterson and John Patterson. Not their first child, just two years prior, the couple would have a baby boy who died at birth. Now their baby girl was here, premature, but otherwise healthy. Lisa Marie Patterson was named after Elvis Presley's daughter. Judy claims to not be an Elvis fan, but can recognize how beautiful the name Lisa Marie is. John could not be there for the birth of his daughter, but he made sure his young wife wasn't alone. Her in-laws were in the, were there in place of her husband. 
she still preferred to have John, and I would too. That's a very exposing act. And I had my with my first daughter, I had my husband and my mom in in the operating room because I had to have C-section with my children. The second time around, I learned I was like, mm, just the husband, please, thank you. Um, even he <laughs> saw too much, but still, I mean, that's not something you want to share with people you are not as familiar with than you are with the person that you became pregnant with or even your own parents. But here Judy was. Lisa was a tiny thing. She was seven pounds, three ounces. Like I said, she was born early and many, many people say it was due to Judy's small drinking habit. If that's what you want to call it. Judy was taking care of John's daughter, who he had from another relationship. They were living in a military town with, with the only people she knew being John's parents. Now she was going to add taking care of their newborn daughter to the list. So she's a stepmom, first and foremost, and then now she's the mother of their daughter. Husband's deployed. The only people you know are your in-laws. That's a very lonely situation. Then... Her husband stopped sending money. He never tells his wife why. So in the summer of 1968, Judy took both of the girls and herself home to her parents. John wanted his family back. He was going to have to come and take them back. After Judy asked for divorce from John in a letter, he showed up at her doorstep. Bam, here I am. Please don't divorce me. The two would try to reconcile their differences and make the marriage work. Truthfully, they were two people who didn't want to see what was right in front of them. Their relationship was over. But in 1970, the couple welcomed another child. Many people, especially during that time frame, believed that a, that a child could mend, repair, whatever you want to call it, a relationship, a marriage. In retrospect, it caused increased stress, increased financial demand. It just it just further drives that wedge between the two of you. In my opinion, it doesn't fix a relationship. Um, you need to be a strong front in order to welcome a child. That's just my opinion. Um, many people do it alone. My mother did. And I turned out just fine. So I'm not damning you because you, you know, went and had a child with somebody that you didn't want to end the relationship with. Um, in retrospect, a lot of people are going, mm, probably shouldn't have done that. But, you know, here we are. Wouldn't go back and change it because we love little Jane Doe and John Doe. They're so cute. Anyways, <laughs> Jenny claimed that John that tried to kill her at this point and then he decided to attempt suicide, but there were never any charges brought up against John and this claim that he wanted Judy dead. Nothing ever came from it. Still, the two could not let go and they were on and off again until Judy found John in the arms of another woman. Judy took off to Texas and left the children with her parents. When Judy did get back to town, she was told by her parents that John had came and taken the children. But it, in just a few days, she would manage to get the kids back and their divorce would finally be filed. Great. You know, when something's run its course, you don't keep beating it to death. It doesn't work. In 1972, Judy would meet the man that would change the course of her oldest daughter's life forever. Jack Kleiner. He was a used car salesman who sold Judy a car and his heart. Quote, he's an angry little man. He will be drunk when you talk to him. He will curse you and lie and deny. End quote. This was the statement that many people described Jack to be. Guess what? They went wrong. Jack was able to put on a ruse, but under the conniving exterior, Jack was capable of stealing the innocence under the nose of the very person who should protect the victim, the mother. Lisa Marie was smart for her rough start to life. She learned to read and write at an 
at age four and reading became her escape from reality. I'm a librarian. I do it. Um, when I don't want to deal, sometimes I'll read a book in an entire day, which is, you know, we all deal with our mental shortcomings. For me, reading is it. I understand it. I get that it's this idyllic life written down on paper and the words that are so grand. They describe it so well. Your mind has zero problems imagining this happening in real life. And that's far better than dealing with, you know, a screaming brother, you know, a screaming sister or mom and dad who are fighting, mom and stepdad are fighting, or in Lisa Marie's case, even worse. When Judy would get mad at Lisa over the littlest things, um, beating her was the chosen form of punishment. Lisa hid in the pages of the books in order to hide away from punishment, hide away from the beatings. When Jack decided he was no longer sexually satisfied by Judy, he turned to Lisa. Again, she used the book to escape. Life was better behind the imagination of another. Judy and Jack moved from the Midwest to the West Coast to Texas and back. They were everywhere and nowhere all at the same time. On February 24th, 1984, Judy either finally saw what she was trying to not see, or this was the first time she was finding out about what had been happening under her nose all along. Judy claims that she woke from her sleep to a noise and found that Jack was not in, in bed. As, as a matter of fact, his side was cold. She figured he was up drinking all night again. Coming from the add-on to their trailer they were currently living in was Lisa Marie's bedroom. There was a grunting, talking possibly jars being moved around kind of noise and at first when Judy woke she thought it was coming from the kitchen but when she walked out of her bedroom she heard it coming from the opposite direction and Judy says quote I opened the door and saw him naked on top of Lisa he just looked up at me and got up end quote instead of beating this man or calling the police she looked at her frightened 15 year old daughter Lisa looked as though it was her fault Jack was in there doing these things to her, and Judy simply told her, go back to bed. Now, I would be coming to you live via um, public radio from uh, Cinder Block Cell had that been my child and my ex-husband, because um, I'd have put him under that edition of my trailer and my daughter would never have been told to just go back to bed no but this is how they handled it they swept it under the rug and instead of accepting it and moving on and, and helping Lisa heal she was taught to push it down and never let it out now, you should all know by now there's no bigger scum on the face of the earth than there is a person who steals the innocence of a child. And that's exactly what Jack is. But I'm going to go one step further here. That's exactly what Judy is. The rumor mill is something I tend to not dwell on, nor do I generally pass it along. But something in me says that this may be the one time Judy saw what was happening to her daughter and thus decided she had made bad choices. Let me elaborate. Rumor is, Judy knew what Jack was doing. She offered Lisa up as a way to keep her husband happy and avoid a second divorce. In that era, divorce was still a little bit on the taboo. Mental health was extremely taboo. So... In an attempt to save your marriage, you give him something that would keep him satisfied, keep him coming back, give him a reason to stay. 
that's where the rumor is. Judy did that. Judy did exactly that. And Lisa was the sacrifice. Another rumor is this was a way for Judy to make side money. She would sell Lisa to who to men who were like Jack. What is known is that during these sessions, Lisa was raped. She was sodomized. She was urinated on and she was beaten. This further contributes to Lisa's later diagnosis and mental illnesses, particularly her PTSD, something that when it first came into the world of psychology, you dealt that diagnosis out to men who had come back from Vietnam and seen some things that most of them still cannot share to this day if they're still surviving. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of this coming out of an attack or something similar to what Lisa had gone through and then PTSD being something as the result. However, here we are. We're early into mental health um, and people looking into it. It's taboo. We don't talk about it. You know, you're depressed. Suck it up, buttercup. Keep going. Fake it till you make it kind of thing. But with Lisa, it just just gave her that strong urge that it was her fault Jack was doing what he was doing. It was her fault because her mother beat her. It was her fault um, because she didn't do it right. Whatever. There, there's a million things that she probably accounted to her error. Does that make sense? Um, I hate this. I hate this being in the background of her history, of her life. Um, it makes it extremely difficult to hate the person she develops into later in life. Does not excuse what she did. Two different, two different things here. So we're going to keep those separated and move on. Judy, she eventually take, she takes Lisa to the doctor the very next day, but not to the police as many would have expected. So if I wasn't a crazy person who off the man who was stealing my daughter's innocence, the very first place, very first phone call, all would have happened to the police department. And we would have gone about this in the legal way. Um, but I am that crazy person, so well, the legal system would just have to deal with me in the end. Judy didn't do that. Took her to the doctor. Lisa revealed that during this visit, she revealed that she was late. Her period was late. So the doctor decided they were going to test her to see whether or not she was pregnant. And then he laid this lovely charm down on her. We'd have to get rid of it because how could you have a baby with your mother's husband? Again, taboo during that area. Maybe more taboo than the mental illness that she suffers from. Definitely up there in the range of shit we don't talk about. Thankfully, she was not pregnant. Judy returned home from the doctor's office and she immediately told Jack to get out of her house. He would do so in his own time, but he did offer a warning prior to leaving, quote, if you tell anyone, I will kill you and the kids, end quote. Lisa Marie had heard this same threat and it stuck with her. Like that was the gospel. Um, you no, you know, we're not going to test and see whether or not he he's going to keep his word. Lisa really never says exactly what Jack had done to her until many years later and long after her crime. And she was in a situation that she was comfortable to the person she was talking to. She was able to let her guard down. There was no judgment. Um, many say it was a ploy in a way for her to get sympathy 
and possibly beat the death sentence. It really wasn't because they laid all this out during her trial. This isn't anything new. It's the details. They become sharper after she goes to prison. So with Lisa, we've got this going on. And this is where we kind of learn about the urination thing. And it seemed to be the men who did frequent Lisa's bedroom and, and perform the same acts as Jack also ended in the same manner when they would urinate on her. Now, that's very degrading. It really does something to your self-esteem. And Lisa's just feeling like there's not a place in this world for her as she's growing. Now, Jack, he's interviewed years later about the ac accusations of sexual abuse against Lisa Marie following her arrest and trial and everything. He adamantly denies ever touching his ex-stepdaughter. Now, if I was him, I'd do the same damn thing. You know, we, we don't tell on ourselves. Why would he come out all these years later and say, well, you know, I really wasn't a nice guy during that time. And, and because I don't think there's a statute on sexual assaults that happen to children anymore. I think most states have abolished that statute. And so now it's, if you can't come to terms with what you suffered through when you were 10 and you're 60, you can still at 60 file charges against the person who assaulted you and they would go to jail for the crimes they committed against you. So no, he's not going to say, yeah, I did it. He's, he's not stupid. He is a used car salesman. One of the most sneaky con artist people on the earth sometimes. Lisa's sister comes out later and says that Lisa admittedly in the beginning denied that Jack ever touched her in that way. But Carl and Lisa's children both say that in time Lisa did talk about the abuse she suffered at the hands of Jack. Lisa, her brain's still developing, she's still developing, hormones are going and you're not really sure what they're telling your body. You know, it's just the perfect combination to produce a mental illness. And for Lisa Marie, it came out through PTSD. Now, Judy, ever the one to fear loneliness, she finds comfort in a man named Richard Bowman. He's the local police chief. Now, the welfare she was on after Jack moved out, it vanishes. And the cold side of the other side of the bed, it's now warm with a man that she left. This marriage would change the course of Lisa's life, but not in the way that marrying Jack would. Lisa would find her first husband, Carl Bowman, the estranged son of Richard Bowman, and the new stepbrother to Lisa. Again, Carl didn't see the newest stepsister in the way that he would some years later. Their first meeting was at his grandmother's Thanksgiving meal, and Lisa Marie was a very young 16-year-old that was not remotely attractive in Carl's eyes. But as Carl was fumbling through life at the age of 23, trying to figure out what it was exactly he wanted to do with his life, Richard decided that Maybe it would be best if he moved home with him and Judy's children and worked at the local prison. Carl didn't know it then, and neither did Richard when he extended the offer, that it would place Carl directly in the path of Lisa Marie. Lisa changed over the year that Carl had come to know her, and she was now showering regularly brushing her hair, wearing makeup, taking pride in how she looked. And in return, Carl was noticing. And a lot of that self-neglect probably stemmed from her coming to terms with the abuse from Jack and how to deal with it. And it's possible that she did not bathe regularly. She did not brush her hair and do these things, hoping that he wouldn't want to touch her. 
And it just became a habit until she decided I would like to be loved by somebody else. And I think that these things are important in how to get somebody to love me kind of thing. So she started it and sure enough, Carl noticed. The one thing he had learned about Judy and her children was that there was a lot of lack of love and affection among them. At 17 years old, Lisa was looking for one thing that all humans yearn for, love and affection. She's not getting it from her mom. After what she went through with her stepfather, that doesn't show you love and affection. That's a masked version of you thinking it is love and affection, but it's not. It's abuse. And now she's got this just desire for someone to see her for who she really is. As Carl talked with Lisa, the these two, they found love for one another. It wasn't love at first sight for these two. They were, I mean, Lisa may have been a little bit, you know, crushing on Carl when she first met him, but Carl wasn't there. He didn't see her. He, she was a young kid. In his eyes, that was never going to happen. However, as he gets to know her, things start to change. Carl could see she needed some help. And he was happy to be there for her, but he never imagined she would tell him what she did, nor did he think that later in life she would be capable of something as horrible as stealing the child of another woman and leaving her to die. The day before Lisa's 18th birthday, she sat in the car with Carl, crying, begging, pleading to let her come and live with him in his new apartment. The two had been seeing each other for about a year at this point, and moving in together was the next step in their relationship. He loved her and she loved him, but Carl was scared because before he came home, he had been in a relationship and he loved this person. She was the mother of his child, but tragically, his child passed away and that led Carl to come home and it also led him to fearing falling for somebody like he had done before and he wasn't really sure that what he found in Lisa was that soulmate kind of way of love. So everything he was still very skittish about doing. Lisa urged for it. Carl was hesitant. But in the end, he did cave. And on her 18th birthday, the very next day after the conversation in the car, she packed her bags and she moved into Carl's apartment. They were going to give their relationship a real, honest-to-goodness try. Lisa worked to finish her senior year living with Carl. Carl was working at the prison doing the job his father helped him get, and he somewhat liked it. With little time spent together, the relationship began to get a little rocky. Lisa had no direction, really, after high school graduation. She took the SATs and scored well. But attending college was of no interest to her. So she brought up the Air Force. And when she first brought it up, she wasn't truly interested in it. They were just words to say in the end. However, things change. What Lisa wanted truly was to be a mother. To correct all the mistakes that her mother made when raising her. A mother to the children of Carl Bowman. But Carl wasn't on board with this whole pregnancy plan. He felt it was too early in their relationship. He didn't feel like they were to a point where they could have a child and grow into a family. He was very hesitant. Now he had lost a child. He had lost a person he loved. He's still healing. Okay. So with Lisa being done with high school and Carl not on board to really start a family, Lisa said, what the hell? Let's go to the Air Force then. So she goes down to the recruiting office and she takes the exam. She scores well, but the physical trips up her enlistment. 
She was unable to ex- be accepted into the United States Air Force at this time because Lisa Marie was pregnant. The pregnancy was a complete surprise to them both. And in the end, they were both very excited about a new baby. It did rush their plan slightly, but marriage was the next step ultimately at some point. So the two decided to get married before the birth of their first child. So Carl, he wears a tux. Lisa wears a beautiful white dress. The couple's happy in their wedding photos. And no one can tell that Lisa's carrying a child. Lisa took to pregnancy very well. You know, there are women out there that carry pregnancy well. And they glow and experience no complications and are seemingly happy when they are carrying a child. And then you have women who are the complete and total opposite hate every moment of it, loathed if they get pregnant more than once. It's just not for them in life. But for Lisa, it was. On January 11th, 1987, Carl and Lisa's first child was born, a beautiful baby girl. The couple was overjoyed by her arrival in their life. And just like her pregnancy, Lisa took to motherhood and being a stay-at-home wife as well. She cooked, she cleaned, she made sure their daughter was fed, clean, dry. No one would describe Lisa being this way come later in life, into her second marriage. When their daughter was about nine months old, Lisa had big news. She was pregnant again. For Carl, it seemed like he was building the perfect little family. Lisa was the perfect wife and mother, and now they were going to have another child. Carl started to notice slight changes in Lisa in her day-to-day, but not enough to make too big of a deal out of them. Just enough to see that the slightest thing was beginning to look like a chore to her instead of of a mother providing. Nevertheless, the couple was happy and in love, and more children were something the two continued to talk about. In 1989, Lisa and Carl welcomed their first son. After two girls, a boy rounded out their family well. Working with the prison system was beginning to be a little bit too much for the young father and husband, and Lisa agreed. She wanted him there for the family more than she wanted him working at that job. He had experienced something that was a little concerning as far as his safety, but in the end, he turned out to be okay. But both Lisa and Carl saw it as a warning sign that his career had possibly come to an end. So Carl and Lisa's parents had moved out to California as a way to save their failing marriage. But Judy had come back to Oklahoma and filed for divorce. Judy is on a repeat in the relationship world. Okay. She's seemingly happy for a little while, things to get rocky, and Judy's quick to throw him down the drain. So that's where they're at. We've got Richard out in California, Judy's in Oklahoma, Carl and Lisa are in Oklahoma trying to have this life, and their parents, which is weird, this whole damn thing, (laughs) sorry, it's not funny, but you know, this is... Jerry Springer couldn't make this shit up. So, in the end, Richard and Judy, they couldn't stay apart long enough. So, they decide to reconcile. And Judy goes back out to California. Well, because their parents are trying to fix their marriage and things look promising out on the West Coast, they decide maybe that's the next step for our family. And Carl saw moving out there to be like a fresh start, exactly what they needed. So Carl and the two daughters went to stay with Richard and Judy while he looked for a job. Lisa stayed back in Oklahoma with their son, and she just was waiting for the call to come from Carl to have her join him. This distance in their marriage was too much too soon. Carl eventually suspected that Lisa was talking with someone else possibly worse, she was cheating on him. So Carl's stepmother and mother-in-law, she only feels that fire because this woman is nothing but drama. 
Um, the more I dig into Lisa's history, the more toxic I see her relationship with her mother being because Judy herself was kind of a toxic person. She just, if things fell apart, it wasn't her fault. She did what she could to, to hold them together kind of thing. In reality, she did very little. So she's talking to Carl and she's saying, you know, I bet that's what Lisa's out there doing. I bet she's in Oklahoma and she's sleeping around. And I heard something about, you know, Jack coming back into her life. And maybe that's what's going on. Who talks about their child in that way? First of all, don't ever air your child's dirty laundry without talking to your child first. Okay. There's that. I realize that he's also your stepson. So you're trying to build that mother-like relationship but until you know the full picture you probably shouldn't say anything Lisa was being distant there is distance between her and her husband physical miles between them two physical states they are away from each other Carl being gone it just fed the insecurities and Lisa she was unable I think to read really the situation for truly what it was and where the work needed to happen but Carl he decided you know surely it's not Jack she's told me kind of some of what he had done to her and he couldn't fathom that she would actually let him back in her life so Judy and Richard decide, you know, we need to go back to Oklahoma because I took some things with me and I need to go get them and bring them back to California. So Carl and the girls decide to hitch a ride back. He was wrong. Maybe moving to California really wasn't the right thing for his family and he couldn't stand the distance between him and his wife anymore. Frankly, he was growing concerned about her lack of asking when she could move out there with him. When Carl got back home, he was welcomed by a very pregnant Lisa. He feared and claimed at first that the baby wasn't his, but when he did the math, the due date was calculated and Lisa became pregnant just months after she gave birth to their son, while the two were still living together. Now, <clears throat> Lisa... Having the shortcomings she did in, as far as concrete thinking, when Carl pointed the finger about infidelity, Lisa did mention that the, the child she was carrying wasn't his. But between talking to the doctor and looking at all that statistics of when the due date is, so here's likely of conception date, there's nobody else it was going to be, Okay. So he realizes, I made a mistake by pointing a finger. Lisa, she realizes, maybe I shouldn't have said that it was somebody else's kid. They decide, let's work on our differences. This baby's yours. Let's do it. Baby number four. Now I want to take a second here and I want to talk about the fact that Lisa and Carl's girls are Irish twins. Now their son and the new baby are Irish twins. If you don't know what those are, those are babies that are born within nine months to 18 months, I think, 15 months between each other. There's not a lot of pregnant birth. There's not a lot of in between there. They're almost getting pregnant right on top of each other. For Lisa, this was increasing the amount of responsibility that she needed to have with having four children so close together. Also, let's talk about what that does to her body. There's hormones that are just wreaking havoc. She's got, you know, she's trying to breastfeed at this time. She's breastfeeding. She's taking care of two under the age of five, plus a newborn son and one on the way. That level of stress is enough in its own but then you factor in the part that she suffered from extreme postpartum depression that would later form into depression you can see where things start to break apart in lisa this is especially hard on her 
Then to have a mother like Judy, who is seemingly incapable of showing love and affection to her children, she's telling her husband most of the time, you know, Lisa's being unfaithful. Hell, even Lisa, she's not doing herself any good when she first claimed that baby wasn't his. All of that, put it together, mix it up, and we get this concoction, right? Um, we created the perfect mental storm, perfect mental health destruction across the board with Lisa. And during a time where we still didn't say that we're seeing a therapist and we didn't say we were taking certain medications due to depression or due to anxiety or due to this, that, or the other, all of that going on. And let's remember Lisa is barely 23 years old at this point. Okay. That is a lot. Marriage. Mother telling everybody that you're sleeping around. Four kids. It's a lot. It isn't until Lisa Marie is arrested and evaluated until she is formally diagnosed with all of these ailments. But any idiot with a pair of eyeballs should be able to look at her and see See or her, look at her history and see that this poor woman was probably severely depressed long before Carl Bowman came into her life. Carl eventually decided he wouldn't live with what Lisa had done and moved him and the girls to San Diego, leaving his son with her. She was struggling to make ends meet and unfortunately she was being a repeat of her mother. She couldn't care for herself, the unborn child and their son, working as many hours as she was in order to pay some of these bills. Relief had to come from somewhere. So Lisa made a tough decision and decided she was going to move to South Texas and live with her aunt. Carl and Lisa still spoke every day. The love that they had developed for one another may have been shaky, but neither was truly ready to let go of the other. So Carl decides that if they were going to mend this rift between them, then Lisa needed to move to San Diego as well. Not in his apartment, of course. She could move in with their parents, but their parents who are divorced but still living together kind of thing. Not a healthy home. So Judy's not the best thing for Lisa, nor would she be the best thing for the entire family. However, Lisa told Carl that Judy was looking to take custody of the children. Carl thought, you know, they may be in this rough patch, but maybe he should have her move in because it's over his dead body he let that robot of a mother-in-law take his kids away. Carl and Judy are now fighting with one another. Words are being said that can't be taken back. And Lisa's watching as the entire family is tore apart even more. One thing's for sure. If his relationship with Lisa is going to survive, she needed to be back under his roof. Judy was not a good influence on Lisa. A month after moving back in with Carl, Lisa gave birth to her and Carl's fourth child, a little girl. This daughter was several months premature like her own mother, except alcohol wasn't a problem. Stress was. Their oldest daughter was in a car accident that caused her to have to be airlifted to the local hospital where she recovered from bumps and bruises and a broken jaw. Shortly after being released and healed, she took a hit from a softball. 1990, Lisa would undergo a tubal ligation. This is a big controversy in her case because some say she was forced into the sterilization procedure. Some say that she knew what she was doing and their regret came later. Whatever, whatever the truth really is, she underwent a tubal ligation and because of the several stressors to her body with the premature birth of her youngest daughter and the level of steroid was given, to force the baby into lung development provided a significant complication during the procedure. Typically during a ligation, the tubes that allow the egg to travel to the uterus where it awaits fertilization, they're blocked either through tying 
which could be as simple as a clip being put into place or by being cut and sealing. In Lisa's case, due to the amount of swelling from the complication, the only option was to completely cauterize the tubes in half, making it completely 100% impossible for Lisa to ever become pregnant again. Now, we've heard stories of women who go under a reversal and it's successful. We've heard stories where they underwent uh, the reversal and it turned out horrific for them. Lisa was not a candidate to even attempt a reversal procedure. Let's attack that rumor mill again, shall we? So, the talk is that after the several pregnancies Lisa had that were right in a row, Carl was starting to see how it was playing on her mental health. Therefore, he pressured the doctor into performing the ligation too soon following the birth of their youngest child, a procedure that Lisa is adamant up until, as far as I know, to the day she died, she never wanted to have. So we have a problem here. The pregnancies, you can see all of it. You can see the toll it, it takes on Lisa with each birth. It seems like she regresses mentally. Uh, so we can see that it's not a healthy thing for her, right? However, if she at the time was lucid and completely deemed sane, there's no reason her husband should have been able to talk a doctor into performing a procedure that the patient did not want. That is violation, it's assault on the body of the person who had the procedure. So she has, she had grounds to stand on had she been educated in that way. That's the rumor mill though. So if it did not happen that way, if Lisa did consent to the surgery, there's nothing you can do when you go back and regret that decision. That's just life. You move on. It's tough. And there's, you know, alternative ways that are quite pricey through surrogacy, through adoption. But having a child she carries, completely impossible. So we have this, had that procedure been done without her full 100% consent or understanding of the procedure, we are looking at a further complication to PTSD. Again, we're still talking about it being a very taboo diagnosis because it was only first recognized in 1980 by the American Psychiatric Association. And it was still highly utilized from the, for those who come home from war. So what Lisa had gone through, most people argue, is not as bad as what a soldier had gone through seeing Vietnam or any of that. However, we are stacking on the abuse because Judy was a very physical disciplinary. Then you have Jack. Then you have two sets of Irish twins. We're talking five years or less. We have a failing marriage. We have, God, there's so much, just the stressors of everyday life. They're all piling down on top of her. You can, maybe at that time you fought the diagnosis of PTSD because you believe it should be reserved for a soldier. Today, we can see that, and she went through an enormous amount of trauma, and her psyche broke in order to deal with it in the way that she was taught to deal with it, which is you take it in, you push it down, you never talk about it again, okay? Something broke. Something snapped. It's severed between the sexual assault of the child, the physical abuse, the multiple pregnancies. This was not how Lisa saw her life going. The thing with Lisa is this. She wanted children, lots of them. However, she was not equipped to handle them or the level of stress that came with it. Neither her mind or body could handle the pregnancies that she wanted. Later in life, it 
we would learn that it was not so much the number of children she could have as to the attention that would come from her being pregnant. We find out later, it's not necessarily the child, but the the bending over backwards, the, oh my gosh, you're pregnant, here, let me help you. That attention is what she craved because she, for whatever reason, associated love with that. And we as human beings want to be loved. She wants to be loved. But the only thing that she can identify as being an action of love is the amount of catering that would happen when she was pregnant. So here we have Lisa just trying to have what every human should be able to find in life. Despite the work that Carl and Lisa were putting into their marriage, it was obvious it was failing. Kel Carl was working long hours to be able to somewhat maintain control over the bills being paid, but Lisa was far from the woman I told you about when she first welcomed their first child. She was no longer keeping up with housework. Their house was filthy. They had a cockroach infestation. There was dirty dishes and trash everywhere. More times than not, her way of feeding the children lunch was taking a cold casserole out of the refrigerator that had been put up as leftovers, setting it down on the floor in front of her children where they are playing, and they would eat from that dish, and she would lay on the couch and read her favorite author, Stephen King. October of 1993, Carl was starting to see the end of his marriage to Lisa. She wasn't doing her part to work on their wedding anymore. He was just frankly tired of trying to do all of it on his own, work, clean, cook, care for the children. He was a married single father and Lisa was perfectly content with it being that way. We could speculate that following the pressure to have the ligation is where Lisa's mentality broke and these things that she once did were no longer of interest as he had taken from her the one thing that she had in life that could make somebody love her. Now without that ability to get pregnant she felt violated again and she no longer wanted to live in the rea reality that had become her life. We can argue that. Does it make sense to to ninety percent of us? No, it doesn't. But that's the that's the thing about having multiple mental illnesses. It does not make sense to us. But if you had taken ten minutes to be inside of the inner thoughts of Lisa. It would make perfect sense in the end. At the end of 1993, we would see Lisa do something she became known for in life. She told Carl that despite the fact that she had had the tubal ligation and they confirmed she would never have children again, well, she was pregnant. This was an attempt to keep him from leaving because if you have all your little ducks in the same damn pond, you can count them all. Doesn't matter what you're doing in that pond, you can count all your ducks. The second Carl splits away, there goes the children, and Lisa can no longer have the control that she's become accustomed to. And so how do we keep that from happening? How do we keep that from splitting apart? Let's have a kid. You know, she was trying to break the size cycle of who Judy was. In reality, she just repeated it at a in a different time and in a different way. Carl and Lisa were stubborn about letting go of their relationship. And like most people who when you're in love you can't see how when you've gone so far in life together, it's really hard to see how life goes on without that person there. Does that make sense? Like if you're married for 20 years, how do you sit down and have breakfast the next day without your wife or your husband, you know, kind of thing. So it wasn't the fear of them not being in a relationship anymore. It was the fear of forgetting or living life without them there. It was that comfortability that they were, that Lisa was in fear of losing. 
the couple decided, let's give it another step. So they began to go to couples counseling with a church that they had become members of under the direction of their pastor. Together, they would come to these sessions hoping to work through some of the issues. However, the root was never completely worked out. At this point, Carl and Lisa had finalized a divorce. They were living separately, but yet they were still talking daily. And it wasn't, it was more than just, hey, I'm calling to talk about the kids. It was more than that. It was like, how was your day? You know, there was still something there between the two of them. Um, there was a lot of growing that needed to occur, but I don't think either one of them were groomed in the way that they should have been in order to do the growing that they saw the need for. That was a tongue twister. So they decided, let's go to the church. Let's talk to the pastor. Let's, let's sit down and see if we can't figure it out. After the much needing counseling is over, Carl and Lisa come together and they are married once again on June 11th of 1994 in the very church responsible to, for counseling them through and rekindling their marriage. The pregnancy, that's what you're curious about, right? Like, I didn't mention anything. Like, what happened? Wait, what did Carl say? Well, the fifth child to the Bowman clan? Yeah, that disappeared into thin air. Nobody, she stopped saying she was pregnant. There was no more mention of it. When Carl decided, yeah, let's go to counseling and fix this, poof, like magic, there was no baby. Don't get too comfy with the idea because it wasn't long after their marriage that Lisa decided to pull the same damn stunt and she cried wolf. This time the wolf came bearing twins. Judy knew it was bullshit. She knew the announcement was not, you know, true. She was there for her daughter's tubal. Carl knew that the only place this pregnancy existed was in the mind of Lisa. But instead of getting to the root of the problem and figuring out what this whole I'm pregnant even though I can't be thing is, Carl, Judy, and Richard decided to tell people behind Lisa's back that she was full of shit. That is a hell of a rumor mill going around. You've got Lisa saying she's pregnant, with twins, but the husband, the mother, and the father-in-law, they're like, mm, no, she's not. Mm -mm. Don't know what she's talking about. Instead of coming to Lisa and, and doing an intervention and being like, why are you developing this story? What can we do to help you? You know, this kind of thing. They're just like, nope, go behind her back. So my thought is in the marriage of Carl and Lisa, and see how she had grown over the years and aware of the childhood that she had, you would think they would want to get her help. She can't be pregnant. She knows she can't. She had an operation. So why does she keep telling people that she is pregnant? Why did you not get to the bottom of that? There should have been a huge red flag showing that Lisa may have had a break with reality. Instead, let's move to New Mexico. That'll fix the problem. 1998, Carl had reached his wits end with Lisa and was not coming out of whatever funk that she was in that would allow her to restore the home from its trash-filled bug infestation to the home she used to have and care for before the multiple children. Come June 30th, Carl was gone with their four children. He moved back to Oklahoma and he left Lisa behind to file for the end of the end of their marriage once and for all. The marriage ended swiftly and Lisa was left to find a place to stay with her mother and new stepfather in Kansas. Oh yeah, Judy remarried. Mm, no big deal. Lisa Marie would be quick to find another way to survive without the only man she had ever known in a man named Kevin Montgomery. Melvern, Kansas may have heard the rumors of how bad Judy was, but none were ready for what Lisa was capable of doing and sending shockwaves through the community. Kevin and Lisa's relationship was still new when out popped Lisa's most famous manipulating trick. She was pregnant. 
What her intentions were are not clear this early in the relationship. Many speculated that she was hoping for a marriage proposal, but Kevin was not that naive. Kevin handed Lisa money to end the pregnancy. We know she pocketed the money and as there was no procedure to be needed. You know the old saying that the more one repeats a lie that it conforms to the reality? Well, Lisa had concocted one that was far-fetched and far from the truth. But the more she repeated it, the more the details ironed out until Lisa could see them play out in her head. Lisa told Kevin that she had gotten pregnant as a teenager and she went through the entire pregnancy the whole way up to giving birth but she was never able to lay eyes on her newborn infant. As she was told, the baby had died, and they didn't want her to get upset when she saw that it was, it was gone. In Lisa's reality, Judy had taken the child and sold it and put it up for adoption without Lisa's consent. This is one hell of a story. It's repeated over and over, each time the details becoming sharper and sharper, and in no time not only did Kevin believe his future wife, but Lisa could vividly remember it happening to her. Kevin and Lisa were married in March of 2000. Most of their small community were surprised by Kevin being so quick to jump into a marriage with Lisa. His divorce from his first wife was quite messy and complicated. Lisa, her three daughters, and son moved with Kevin, and when it was Kevin's weekend, his three sons would come to the house. And to say that to have, what is that, nine people, that's a chaotic and overstimulating environment. Possibly even being a trigger to someone with the mental complications that Lisa had but was completely unaware of. In September of 2001, Lisa and Kevin rented a larger farmhouse far from the peering eyes of neighbors, just beyond the graveyard on a dirt gravel road, South Adams Road. This put Kevin driving 70 miles to work, and the family took to small farming. They raised hogs, one or two cows a year, and Angora goats. All of this Lisa was doing to teach her children down home cooking and raising livestock and how to just fend for yourself. Lisa and the children would shear the wool from her goats, clean it, pick grass stickers or imperfections out, a task the children hated, but Lisa felt she was instilling in them hard work, dedication, and patience. When she wasn't trying to do anything and everything, she was on the internet. This is the beginning of society's addiction to constantly be connected to people around the world. Lisa was the same as you and me. She joined several chat rooms and asked for advice on how to further her skills and knowledge on what to do when spinning the hair into yarn. Most of the time, these posts regarded her children, the ones from Carl, and spoke all about all the ones she was going to have with Kevin. Those who knew Lisa around town said that it would be easier to say the times when she wasn't pregnant versus the times where she said she was pregnant. And the number of miscarriages soared with each time she claimed to be pregnant. What Lisa left out when planning her future with Kevin is telling him about the tubal ligation she underwent following the birth of her fourth child. Lisa kept that part a secret, and Kevin was none the wiser, and they were actively trying to conceive, but each time it seemed like caring to term was a doomed hope. The pastor from their church said that Kevin and Lisa were excited to have their children. One thing he picked up on is the desperation in Lisa's tone. The more she talked about having children, saying, quote, she would be attached at the hip to her husband, end quote. There may not have been any rifts in the marriage, but developing in Lisa's mind, she was spinning these into true worries and felt her husband was slipping even if Kevin hadn't nudged an inch. 
In 2002, Lisa began breeding rat terriers, the hobby or short-lived to get rich quick hustle, what, whichever. This would lead Lisa down a road that she would never come back from. But with the online world of rat terrier breeders and people that Lisa could talk to and, I, and would allow her to escape the reality she was in, very similar to what she had done with books before, Lisa was constantly on the internet. June 2003, Lisa began working with another breeder in the Kansas City area. He had a male that she wanted to breed with. The two, they met up for a couple of friendly exchanges before the actual breeding session. This breeder never truly felt comfortable around Lisa. There was something he says he couldn't quite put his finger on, but he just knew there was something off. But the fact that Lisa told lies, even small, unnecessary ones, it was the thing that would push this breeder away. Then another woman questioned the pedigree of one of Lisa's puppies. This sent the entire breeder online group into a frenzy and everybody turned against Lisa and wanted her out of their circle. This group was a one and done kind of world, except for the fact that Bobby Joe Stinnett was a part of it. Bobby Joe came to Lisa's defense and supported her through this dark time. Lisa eventually was welcomed back in under probationary terms, but they would be back at her again when the math just didn't add up. Lisa was given a pure brad by another breeder. Lisa would send them photos of the dog as it grew up. In reality, Lisa gave the dog away, and she would go visit those who had the dog and would take pictures during these visits to send to the person who gave her the animal. Slowly, the rat terrier world is starting to close in on Lisa. The wife and mom that Lisa wanted to be when she begged Carl for their first child were starting to come back to her as she began her life with Kevin. She was cycling through. Lisa was attending Little League games. She was knitting as she watched TV or the games or whatever. She helped the kids with their stuff with 4-H. She made special clothing for her special events for her children just to help them do better. Lisa also juggled working with her home busy life. At one point, she had three different jobs on top of the farm raising and the kid raising and the husband and the wife thing. She had all that on her plate. In the summer of 2003, Lisa's half-brother, Teddy, he had a child. Lisa began to beg or badger the couple to give her the baby. In this instant, the child ended up being taken away from the brother um, it was the right instinct. Teddy and the baby's mom struggled with a drug addiction. And instead of giving the boy to someone who had the means to help and care for him, they would take him with them to go score more drugs. Many say that the reason her half-brother was arrested was because Lisa turned him in. Now that the boy had been removed from their custody, Lisa swooped right in and continued on her pursuit to get custody of the child. By the fall of 2003, Lisa was back into her maternity clothing and telling everyone and anyone that would listen she was pregnant. This could possibly be in her mind a way to help her case of getting custody of her nephew and fighting against her mother, Judy. Judy and Lisa went into two different court appearances, and at first Lisa was in her maternity clothing and, and tried to play on the judge's um, emotions, thinking that there would be no better place to put a child than with a woman who has one on the way. But on the second appearance, Lisa was back in normal clothing, 
and attempted another route to the judge's emotions and spoke about her miscarriage at six months and how she had donated the baby to science. I don't know if she was hoping that would rule in her favor as a way to fill the void of this false miscarriage. Whatever the case may be, none of it worked, and the little boy was given to Judy. Lisa's multiple failed attempts to say she was pregnant and be pregnant were piling up. If she didn't deliver a child to Kevin, not only would she lose him, but they could put her away. Well, somewhere along the way, Lisa decided that she would buy a baby. She had heard through the grapevine that Carl's current wife was coming into some inheritance money. Lisa decided that she would deny Carl any visitation to their four children unless he paid her $45,000 to wipe away his back child support. Neither Carl or his new wife had that kind of money. So Lisa threatened and threatened, and eventually she scared Carl's wife. When Lisa's sister ran into the convenience store that Lisa was working at, Lisa had news. She lifted her shirt. And had her sister fill her belly and because she was pregnant. Again, confused, her sister knew she couldn't be pregnant, but had a, she knew about the tubal ligation. And yet here she was, she had this distended belly and it's hard like a woman who is growing a child. Things are not adding up. But when you're demanding money to buy a child, you kind of need a ruse of I'm pregnant to cover up when you do get custody of the child. Lisa's family, they knew the truth. She couldn't be pregnant. Kevin's family believed that she was, and they were so excited for the new baby. But Lisa's family had had enough, and her sister was going to set this record straight. So Lisa's sister comes over to the Montgomery farm home one night. And when Lisa answers the door, she's bypassed by her sister who walks right up to Kevin and tells him, quote, your wife cannot be pregnant because she had a tubal ligation in 1990, end quote. Lisa's gig was up, or at least that's what her family had hoped. When that didn't work, Lisa's family decided to go to Kevin's family and tell them about Lisa and her tendency to lie. But in the years that they had come to know Lisa, she had been grooming them to think that Lisa's mother and siblings were out to hurt her, and she couldn't figure out why they were so vengeful towards her. When in reality, it was Lisa doing the hurting. Her family was becoming increasingly concerned about her and her mental health. During all of this chaos, Lisa, with her youngest daughter, attended a dog show. At the show, Lisa would finally meet the woman who stood up in her defense, Bobby Joe Stennett. But this would not be the last time the two would meet. Pseudosiasis is a condition in which the patient has all signs and symptoms of pregnancy except for the confirmation of the presence of a fetus. Their bodies may even start to produce pregnancy signs or symptoms, swollen belly, enlarged breasts, and even the sensation of fetal movement. 
Researchers have suggested that those that come from poverty, lack of education, childhood sexual abuse, or relationship problems may play a role in triggering false pregnancy. Lisa had more than one of those triggers in her life. The sexual abuse and relationship problems were major triggers for Lisa in announcing that she was pregnant at the drop of a hat. Surely no one could be as fertile as she claimed to be to all those who knew her in Melbourne. But in reality, Lisa had developed this sense that if she did not provide Kevin with a baby, that he would leave her. Both partners brought children into their relationship, but none bound Lisa to Kevin or Kevin to Lisa. Fear of losing someone to love her was Lisa's greatest weakness, just like her mother. Life could not possibly go on if there was no one there to love her, and the only way to guarantee that was with a baby. Trying to talk to someone into giving her a baby didn't work. Extortion of her ex-husband and his wife didn't work. And she wasn't capable of actually having a baby. All were in the back of her mind when she met Bobby Joe and realized that she was pregnant too. Another round of Lisa's lies led her to devise a plan that would put her face on the front page of newspapers and news headlines for years to come. Fetal abduction may be rare, but one thing is for sure, Lisa Marie Montgomery's name will forever be tied to the crime. She puts a face to the monster capable of stealing a child from the womb. I want to thank you all for joining me tonight as we dive into a psychological heavy case. Fetal abduction and federal death sentences are two of the rarest of the rare, but Lisa Marie Montgomery is the only one to have both attached to her name. Next week, we will get to know the beautiful Bobby Jo Stinnett. She was meant to be a mother, only she would never become a mom because someone selfish wanted to be mom more. As always, I leave you with one last line. The truth doesn't cost you anything, but a lie could cost you everything. Much love, the true crime librarian.